Simon & Schuster Audio presents Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, by J. M. Dillard. Read by James Doohan. Aboard the USS Excelsior, Captain Hikaru Sulu lifted his teacup from the console arm of the command chair and took a leisurely sip as he surveyed the bridge. His science officer, Lieutenant Commander Valtain, studied a report that had just come up from the science department. Sulu had not seen the report, but he suspected it said that Excelsior's three-year mission in charting the Radovian sector was complete. The captain smiled faintly as he remembered the ribbing Scott had given him about the Excelsior. Sulu, it's just a bucket of bolts. Suddenly, Sulu was distracted by a faint, high-pitched clatter. He looked down to see the teacup trembling in its saucer a split second before he became aware that the entire ship was vibrating. The vibration increased to teeth-shattering intensity as the ship tried to shake herself apart. The teacup shattered. Valtain shouted from the science console over the growing rumble. I have an energy wave from 240 degrees Mark 6 port. Visual. The bridge view screen flared brightly as the enormous shock front approached, carrying with it the roiling, superheated gases and flaming chunks of debris. Shields! The bridge lights flickered, then pulsed blood red as the ship's sensors detected the danger. The Excelsior reeled and lurched to starboard. Sulu braced himself and watched the riotous ballet of crimson shadows. He turned to his helmsman. Starboard thrusters, turn her into the wave. Quarter impulse power. The strategy worked. The ship bucked one final time, then righted herself. Sulu turned to Valtain, who was already back on his feet and peering down at his console. Don't tell me that was any asteroid shower. Negative. The subspace shockwave originated at bearing 323 Mark 75, the location of Praxis, a Klingon moon. Barren of indigenous life forms, but the Klingon's key energy production facility. The science officer leaned over his station and studied the readout. I have confirmed the location, Captain, but I cannot confirm the existence of Praxis. Sulu swiveled his chair to face the Excelsior's communications officer, Lieutenant Rand. Send the following report to Starfleet Command. While traveling through the beta quadrant of the Radovian sector, we have monitored a large explosion. The hospital room was dimly lit. Carol Marcus lay on the bed, lips parted, chest rising and falling in time with the respirator. She was on the respirator because of damage to her brain stem. It would be days before the doctors would know whether she would respond to treatment. As Jim Kirk bent to kiss her, he half believed his touch might wake her. Over the years, he had spent every available moment of his leave with her. He had begun to take comfort in the notion that when the Enterprise was no longer his, Carol would be waiting. They had quit blaming each other for being so alike, so fiercely independent. They had quit blaming each other for the loss of their son. David's death a decade earlier at the hands of the Klingons should have driven them apart. Instead, it had brought them together. He sat with Carol for an hour, then let Quan May Suarez, a friend of Carol's, lead him to a quiet alcove. Suarez bore no visible signs of injury from the attack on Themis, the science station where she and Carol had worked. Yes, I was there. Hardly a scratch on me. Kwanme, did you see anything during the attack? When they first fired on us, we thought it was an earthquake. We knew about the recent attack on Kodeo, but to think that the Klingons would dare attempt an attack so far inside Federation space seemed insane. I ran to the window to see what was happening. Before the building went down, I could see the phaser fire coming right out of the sky. Did you get a good look at the ships? I couldn't see them. The phaser fire came out of nowhere. It seemed to originate below the clouds. 
as if the ship were simply invisible. Jim nodded sympathetically while believing none of it. What Quan Mei was suggesting was entirely impossible. The Klingons did not possess a ship capable of firing while cloaked. He noticed that a Starfleet medic was standing by, trying to catch his eye. Captain Kirk, there's an Admiral Cartwright trying to track you down, sir. If you will follow me. At Starfleet headquarters in San Francisco, Dr. Leonard H. McCoy entered the briefing room. Judging from the number of bemetalled brass in the room, McCoy guessed they were in serious trouble indeed. Three months to retirement, and Starfleet was still hell-bent on getting them all killed? He was hardly surprised to see Scott, Uhura, and Chekhov already seated, with two places saved. Anybody have any idea what this is all about? Scott, his broad, ruddy face set in a scowl, leaned over to McCoy. Haven't you paid any attention to the news lately, man? There's only one thing this could mean. War. Scotty, it's not going to come to that. We've been close to war with the Klingons before. Didn't you hear about the attack on Themis? McCoy blinked. Themis? I've been too busy with my grandkids to keep up with the news. You mean the Klingons? Check off beat Scott to the punch. Attacked another planet. Mostly just scientists in research facilities, but farther from the border. McCoy closed his eyes. Another attack? Was anyone killed? Aye. Some of the researchers. No reason for the Klingons to damn near blow the entire planet to bits. <laughs> Scotty sat back. McCoy tried to change the subject. Well, where's Spock? Chekhov shook his head. No one has seen him. I don't believe he's coming. McCoy arched an eyebrow in surprise, then lowered it as he caught sight of Jim Kirk coming through the door. Jim, over here. Kirk came in looking as though someone had just died and took his seat with a curt nod to everyone. What's up, Bones? Maybe they're throwing us a retirement party. Starfleet's commander-in-chief Rear Admiral William Smiley entered. I'll make this as simple as possible. The Klingon Empire has roughly 50 years of life left to it. For full details, I am turning this briefing over to our special Federation envoy. McCoy heard Jim Kirk's sharp intake of breath as Spock walked to the podium. Good morning. Let me begin by telling you that two months ago, a Federation starship monitored an explosion on the Klingon moon Praxis. We believe it was caused by overmining and insufficient safety precautions. At this time, a reactor exploded, contaminating the Klingon homeworld's atmosphere and causing an instability in their orbit. They will have depleted their supply of oxygen in less than 50 Earth years. Due to their enormous military budget, the Klingon economy does not have the resources with which to combat this catastrophe. Last month, at the behest of the Vulcan ambassador, I opened a dialogue with Gorkon, Chancellor of the Klingon High Council. He proposes to commence negotiations at once for an end of 70 years of unremitting hostility. Someone in the back of the room asked a question. So we're totally discounting the Organians? In light of the recent attacks on Kodeo and Themis, it seems wise. All attempts on the Federation's behalf to contact the Organians concerning Klingon violation of the treaty have failed. If the Klingons sue for peace, we could accumulate savings in defense expenditures, leaving the Federation economy free to grapple with urgent social problems. Admiral Cartwright rose angrily. I must protest. If we dismantle the fleet, we'll be defenseless before an aggressive species led by an unprincipled tyrant. The opportunity here is to embargo trading, force them to run through their own resources faster, and bring them to their knees. Smiley rose to reply. Starfleet is under civilian control, Admiral Cartwright. 
The decision is a political one, not a military one, and it's been made. Now, let me get down to why we called you here. Captain Kirk, you are to be our first olive branch. You are to rendezvous with the Klingon ship that is bringing Chancellor Gork on here and escort him safely through Federation space. The Chancellor specifically requested you and your officers. Borgus threat! Scott muttered an oath under his breath. Kirk found his voice. Why, in God's name? There are some Klingons who feel the same about a peace treaty as yourself and Admiral Cartwright. They'll think twice about attacking the Enterprise under your command. So if there's no further business, I wish you and your crew Godspeed. Thank you all. As the room emptied, Kirk kept telling himself that Spock could not have known when he volunteered the Enterprise that Carol Marcus would be among the wounded on Themis. Spock obviously thought the assignment would help him completely recover from his grief over David, from his hate. Spock studied him from the podium. Captain, I heard only moments before the briefing about Carol Marcus' injury. Jim, I'm sorry. The arrangements had been finalized. Kirk jerked his head in Spock's direction. Unarmed scientists, and the Klingons never gave them a chance. How can you deal with killers? Captain, all Klingons did not kill David or murder those on Kodeo and Themis. You are blaming an entire race for the acts of a few individuals. Spock, killing is their way of life. They're animals. Spock's eyes narrowed slightly. His lips parted only a few millimeters. Jim, they're dying. Let them die. I grieve with you over the death of your son, Captain, and the injuries to Carol Marcus. But we have been given a choice, peace or war. As a Vulcan, I am bound to choose peace. Spock. You're a fool if you think the Klingons intend to negotiate in good faith. Then Kirk left to report to the Enterprise, feeling at once ashamed at the depth of his hatred and far too angry to care. By midday of the next day, all hands had reported to their stations and the Enterprise was ready for departure. As Kirk and Spock headed for the turbo lift on the way to the bridge, the captain felt able to broach the subject calmly. Spock, I'm still not happy about your manipulating me into this, but despite what happened on Themis, I'll afford the Klingons every courtesy. I had no doubt whatsoever of that, Captain. As the lift doors opened, Kirk stepped out onto the bridge and moved toward the con where McCoy was already standing, while Spock crossed toward his station. He did a slight double take as the con swung around and a young Vulcan female vacated the chair. Her straight black hair, cut short and severe, framed a fragile, beautiful face. Captain on the bridge. As you were, uh, uh, have uh, we met, uh, Lieutenant? Valera, sir. We were told you needed a helmsman, so I volunteered. She saluted Spock, and Spock returned Valera's salute. Lieutenant, I am pleased to see you again. Spock turned to Kirk and explained. The lieutenant recently graduated at the top of her class from Starfleet Academy. I was her sponsor. Valera assumed her station at the helm. All right, let's get this over with. Departure stations. Kirk took in the bridge and thought to himself, the last time. Can this really be the last time we'll be taking her out of space dock? Valeris paused at the door to Spock's quarters. While applying for Vulcan citizenship, she had learned of the possibility of his sponsoring her application to the Academy and he had granted it to her. 
She admired Spock greatly, and she wanted to speak with him privately. The door opened and closed behind her as she stepped inside. Spock was dressed in his meditation robe and was lighting a votive candle. I have come to tell you, Captain Spock, that we have arrived at the rendezvous point. Spock turned to study her. You have done well, Valeris. As your sponsor at the Academy, I have followed your career with satisfaction. And as a Vulcan, you have surpassed my expectations. Valeris struggled to keep from flushing. She had learned biocontrol late in life and still found it the most challenging of her studies. You wish to see me. He gestured at a low divan. She drew a breath and sat. Sir, I speak to you as a kindred intellect. Do you not recognize that a turning point has been reached in the affairs of the Federation? Alaris, history is filled with turning points. You must have faith that the universe will unfold as it should. Is that logical? Surely we must... Klingon battlecruiser up the port bow. All hands on deck. Klingon battlecruiser up the port bow. All hands on deck. With practiced skill, Spock slipped his meditation robe off and his uniform jacket on. Logic is the beginning of wisdom, Lieutenant, not the end. The two of them started for the door. Before it opened, Spock stopped and faced her. This will be my last voyage aboard this ship as a member of her crew. I intend, Valeris, for you to replace me. Valeris fought back a rush of very unvulcan emotion. I could only succeed you, sir. Never replace you. They headed for the bridge in silence. She had not communicated all that she had wished, but considered that perhaps such things were best left unsaid. Captain's personal log, stardate 8979.3. It was alarming, to say the least, when today, on the view screen, a Klingon battlecruiser, the Cronus One, loomed at alarmingly close range. My first instinct was to think about raising the shields. Soon, the image of the battlecruiser was replaced by the lordly countenance of a Klingon dressed in the red and black vestments of his culture's aristocracy. His neatly trimmed beard was streaked with silver. He introduced himself as Chancellor Gorkon. I made an effort to be polite and invited the Chancellor and his party to dine with us this evening aboard the Enterprise. Gorkin graciously accepted the invitation, but I can't shake the conviction that allowing Klingons aboard the Enterprise will lead to disaster. I was surprised by a suggestion from Lieutenant Valeris that we use our supply of Romulan ale to make the evening pass more smoothly. Lieutenant Valeris is clearly far from being a typical Vulcan. There is a boldness about her that I like. I've ordered the ale to be served, hoping she is right. Still, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I have never trusted the Klingons and never will. I have never been able to forgive them for the death of my son. But Spock says this could be an historic moment and I'd like to believe him. But how can history get past people like me? In the Enterprise transporter room, Kirk forced himself not to finger the collar of his dress uniform for the thousandth time. Beside him, McCoy and Spock waited as Scotty worked the transporter controls. Three male figures dressed in solid military black materialized on the back pad to the transporter platform. On the three front pads, Gorkon, an older officer, and a female materialized. Kirk gestured toward his officers and made the introductions. Gorkon turned to gaze at the Klingon female with unabashed pride. Gentlemen, this is my daughter, Azidbur. Slender, her waist-length black hair smoothed back by a silver skull ornament, as it were, moved toward them with a measured grace and nodded to her hosts. 
My military advisor, Brigadier Kerler. Kirk nodded to the tall, bearded young Klingon who stepped from the platform. Kerler returned the gesture with a faint air of belligerence. And this is my chief of staff, General Chang. Chang was almost a head shorter than Kerler, and bald save for a gray mustache. His right eye gleamed coldly as he stared at Kirk. His left eye was hidden by a black patch. Chang advanced, wearing a grim little smile. I've always wanted to meet you, Captain. He stood inches away from Kirk's face, as if testing his host's capacity to flinch. Kirk pulled himself away and motioned at the transporter room door. Right this way, please. I thought you might enjoy a brief tour. In the corridor, Lieutenant Valeris watched unobserved as Captain Kirk led the Klingon delegation past two crewmen, Burke and Samno, who snapped to attention. As soon as the Klingons were out of sight, Burke winked at his companion. Well, they all look alike. And what about the smell? Samno started laughing. You know, only, only the top of the line models can even talk. Valeris understood the reasons for Burke and Samno's hatred, though she did not condone it. Her parents had served in the Vulcan diplomatic corps, and several months prior to the Organian intervention, the Vulcans had vowed to find a way to prevent what seemed like an imminent war between the Federation and the Klingon Empire. Acting as representatives of Vulcan on a peace mission, her parents contacted the Klingons, but their attempt for peace was met with treachery, and her mother was killed. After that, her father became reclusive, believing peace and the Klingons were incompatible, and he did not give her a proper Vulcan education. She had good reason to agree with Captain Kirk. The Klingons could not be trusted. In the officer's mess, dinner was proceeding smoothly. Spock felt encouraged. Despite the tension he had sensed aboard the ship, both the Klingons and Enterprise bridge crew seemed to be getting along. The Romulan ale had served its purpose. Against the backdrop of stars, Gorkon raised his crystal goblet. I give you a toast. The undiscovered country, the future. Spock lifted his own goblet and took a perfunctory sip. Hamlet, Act Three, Scene One. Gokon smiled, delighted. Oh, Captain Spock, you have never experienced Shakespeare until you have read him as the original Klingon. I do not understand, Chancellor. The undiscovered country clearly refers to the fear of death. But uh, do you not see that it is also a metaphor concerning fear of the unknown? Peace is something new and frightening to us, but we must be willing to embrace that fear and move into the future. Spock nodded thoughtfully, then watched as General Chang turned to Kirk with a maliciously pleasant expression. To be or not to be, that is the question which preoccupies our people, Captain Kirk. McCoy broke the awkward silence that followed. His face flushed, eyes shining. He lifted his glass with a surge of enthusiasm. Now well, to you, Chancellor Gorkon, one of the architects of the future. Spock lifted his glass but did not drink, concerned by how quickly the Romulan ale seemed to be affecting the humans. Sober and reserved, Ezad Burr addressed him. Captain Spock, mindful of all your work behind the scenes, and despite the cordiality of this dinner, I do not sense an acceptance of our people throughout your ship. The crew is naturally wary. We have been in a state of war for a long time. General Chang addressed Kirk abruptly. Captain Kirk, are you willing to give up Starfleet? Kirk stared at the Klingon without answering. Spock intervened. 
I believe the captain feels that Starfleet's mission has always been one of peace. I joined because it was a rare opportunity for one interested in the sciences. Science? <laughs> a great deal of science went into the construction of your torpedo banks. Aye, to protect the Federation planets from the likes of... That will be enough, Mr. Scott. Palms on the table, Scott pushed himself to his feet. I haven't served 30 years in the engine room to be accused of gunboat diplomacy. We're explorers. A cough interrupted the argument. Spock turned to see Gorkon, his expression somber, as he rose to leave. When I see we all have a long way to go. He rose. As Spock and the others followed suit, the Vulcan succeeded in mastering the keen embarrassment evoked by the Enterprise crew's behavior. Spock wondered if he had totally misjudged the capacity of human beings for peaceful coexistence. If Gorkon felt the same, their chances of attaining peace in the galaxy were remote indeed. Having returned to the Cronus One and under the watchful eye of her bodyguard, as it were hesitated at the door to her father's quarters, she did not know why she had come, except to verify with her own eyes that her father still lived. The nights before they set sail for Earth, had been plagued by troubling dreams of his death. She felt unspeakable relief when the door opened to reveal Gorkon. She turned to her guard and signaled for him to remain outside. When the door closed, she scolded her father. Where are your guards? He focused his dark amber eyes on her. Gone. The ill rendered them useless. Come, sit. Father, I am concerned. I did not realize the depth of hatred that awaits us on Earth until we went aboard the Enterprise. <laughs> it startled me as well. Father, Kirk hates us. Kirk is not dangerous. His hatred is an honest one. His son was killed by a Klingon. Then why should he not seek revenge? Well, Kirk is not a Klingon. He is not sworn to blood revenge. But we both know my chances of surviving beyond this peace conference are remote. If I die, you must succeed me. As it burr stared at him, stricken. You will not die. Listen to me, Jutta. You must succeed me. There is no one else I can trust. Perla is too hot-blooded, a warrior at heart, and Chang is too shrewd to trust. You are the only one. A female chancellor, father? I have the right to name my successor. I have made special arrangements with other members of the High Council. They have all sworn to protect you and confirm your appointment. You will not die as long as you can manage to keep your guards from getting drunk. She swept from the room, unable to look at him, knowing the sight of his face would break her heart. After his daughter left, Gorkon assembled his advisors in his stateroom. Soon he found himself in the midst of a debate with General Cord about whether to trust the Federation or wage war. Suddenly, with dizzying impact, the room's axis swung 90 degrees. For an instant, a port bulkhead became the floor. Gorkon was caught in an insane tumble of arms, legs, and furniture. Then the ship righted itself with a groan, and Gorkon was flung back against the cold metal floor. He knew they had been hit, and a half breath later, another blast shook the ship. Instead of colliding with the bulkhead, this time, Gorkon lingered, weightless, in the air. The gravity generator had failed. He watched as his security guards flailed vainly in pursuit of weapons that floated just out of reach. The sounds of weapons fire and screaming came from beyond the door of the stateroom. The door opened, a body sailed through, 
followed by a floating slick of blood. Two Starfleet crewmen stood in the doorway, heavy gravity boots on their feet, blasters in their hands, raised and ready to fire. One of the men fired. Orkon shuddered at the fiery agony that consumed him from chest to abdomen, but did not permit himself to cry out. Instead, he thought of his daughter Azadbur before surrendering to the darkness. After dinner, Kirk had made it to his quarters with only a small amount of difficulty. He had tried to make an entry into his captain's log, but for a time he had drifted on the verge of sleep, then had started at the intercom's shrill signal. It was Spock requesting him to come to the bridge. As he entered, Kirk squinted at the main view screen, then rubbed his eyes. What is it, Spock? We are reading an enormous amount of neutron radiation, Captain. Kirk glanced at Cronus on the screen. Where? Curiously, it appears to emanate from us. Kirk strode over to Valeris at the helm. Lieutenant, do you know anything about a neutron surge? As he spoke, a photon torpedo streaked from the bottom of the view screen and struck the Cronus with a dazzling white-hot force. Spock bent over his readout. We have fired on the Chancellor's ship. Kirk whirled around in disbelief. Uhura, monitor. Check off. Find out what's going on down on weapons. A second torpedo flared in the bottom corner of the screen. Spock, who's doing that? Spock bent over his viewer. The Klingon ship's hull has been breached. They have lost gravity and are slowly losing life support. Kirk stared at the screen. The Enterprise could not have fired on the Cronus. Not unless sabotage was involved. Uhura, signal our surrender. She returned to her board and complied. Kirk struck a toggle on the console arm. Torpedo Bay, did we fire those torpedoes? Negative, Captain. According to inventory, we're still fully loaded. Spock frowned as he checked the information on his viewer. Data banks reconfirm, Captain. Two photon torpedoes fired. Behind Kirk, the lift door snapped open and shut. McCoy appeared at the captain's side, medikit in hand. What the hell's going on? I wish I knew. I'm going aboard, Spock. You have the con. Spock stood in front of the lift, blocking Kirk. I am responsible for involving you in this, Captain. I will go. No, Spock. As Captain, I have to convince them I didn't give the order to fire. Perhaps you're right, Captain. Kirk saw a hint of gratitude in Spock's eyes. Well, Jim, I'm going to. They may need a doctor. Uhura, tell them we're coming, and tell them we're unarmed. In the garish light of the Cronus transporter room, Jim Kirk squinted at the phasers aimed so close to his head that he could see they were set to kill. Neither he nor McCoy stirred as they were searched. Brigadier Curla stormed into the room. Are you mad? You attack us? Then tell us you're beaming aboard. I give you my word, I gave no order to fire. Quaking with fury, Curla led Kirk, McCoy, and two guards to what had once been the Chancellor's stateroom. In the center of the room, Chang crouched beside Azadbur as she sat, cradling her father in her arms. McCoy hastened to Gorkin's side. Jim, he's still alive. Can we get him onto the table? The Klingons lifted the Chancellor gently onto the conference table. With General Chang hovering over his shoulder, McCoy scanned Gorkon with a strike order. Yeah, sweet Jesus. He's lost a lot of whatever this stuff is. Kirk stared down into Gorkin's face. The Chancellor's blonde complexion had gone ashen. Bones, can you save him? Jim, I don't even know his anatomy. The wounds aren't closing. Gorkin groaned and reached out. Chang lunged at the doctor. Why, you're killing him! 
Jim held Chang back while frantically McCoy tore open Gorkon's collar. Well, he's gone into some kind of a rest. Come on, damn it. McCoy pounded on the Klingon's chest. The Chancellor's eyes dulled. His jaw slackened. Jim, I've lost him. As it were, gathered her father into her arms. Chang faced the two humans, his expression one of grim triumph. Under Article 184 of Interstellar Law, I place you both under arrest. You are charged with assassinating the Chancellor of the High Council. Kirk and McCoy were too stunned even to struggle as the Klingons led them both away. Sarek, ambassador from Vulcan, sat in the office of Federation President Ra Gorathari and listened as Komarag, his Klingon counterpart, stated the Empire's case against Leonard McCoy and James Kirk. Unfortunately, it was a most logical, well-reasoned argument. When Komarag finished, Sarek began quietly. I do not believe that Captain Kirk and Dr. McCoy are guilty of the crimes with which they are charged. Kamarak's face darkened. Mr. President, our esteemed colleague is clearly prejudiced. His son is Kirk's first officer. Sarek interrupted him and continued, but I am obliged to agree with my esteemed colleague's legal interpretation. Kirk and Dr. McCoy were properly arrested, and the Klingons are within their rights to try them. President Ragaratari stared at Sarek unhappily. It was not what he wanted to hear, but it was the truth. Legally, the Federation was bound by interstellar law to let the trial proceed. The senior officers gathered on the bridge of the Enterprise and listened solemnly to Uhura. They have been arrested for the assassination of Chancellor Gorkon and must stand trial. Scott, Uhura, Chekhov, and Valeris turned expectantly to Spock. I assume command of this ship as of 0130 hours. Uhura, notify Starfleet headquarters. Explain precisely what has taken place and request instructions. He turned to find Valeris staring at him, a brow lifted in disbelief. But Captain Spock, you cannot allow them to be taken back to the Klingon homeworld as prisoners. What do you suggest, Lieutenant? Opening fire on the Klingon vessel will not retrieve the captain. We must endeavor to ascertain what happened here tonight. According to our databanks, this ship fired those torpedoes. No way! Mr. Scott, you forget yourself. Please accompany me to the torpedo bay. They headed for the turbolift. When Scott and Spock reached the torpedo bay, they stared at the impossible. It's as I said, Mr. Spock. Inventory still registers every torpedo. Yet, Mr. Scott, the data banks insist we fired. Therefore, we must check the torpedoes visually. Well, that could take hours. And what if they're all here? Then, someone aboard the ship forged a data bank entry. Both men glanced up as Valeris descended into the bay. Captain Spock. They have named Gorkon's daughter Chancellor. I heard the report. Indeed, Lieutenant. Any reply from Starfleet to our dispatch? Spock noted her hesitation and studied her keenly. Under his scrutiny, she straightened, her expression utterly impassive. Commander Uhura has reported experiencing technical difficulties, sir. Curious. Spock had been prepared to commandeer the Enterprise on his own and release the crew from any obligation to follow his orders. Uhura, it seemed, had provided a way that might spare them all 
court martials. Very well, Valeris. For 24 hours, we will agree that this conversation did not take place. A lie, Captain Spock? An omission. Scott had listened to the exchange with growing anxiety. 24 hours from now, we won't have a clue to where the captain is. Mr. Scott, I know precisely where he will be. McCoy stood beside Kirk in the center of the courtroom and was frightened. The courtroom was a curious blend of cathedral and circus, a cavernous stadium hewn from jagged rock. At its center was the prisoner's dock, which was spotlighted. He squinted and could just make out the cameras suspended from the high stone walls. Everyone in the galaxy would be watching the debacle. Then he realized with hope that Spock and the Enterprise crew would also be watching. He scanned the high tiers jutting above them just as Chancellor Azadur entered with her entourage. The audience began to chant Kirk's name. They called out softly at first, increasing to a thunderous roar until McCoy felt it in the soles of his feet. The defense attorney, a Colonel Worf, entered the arena. He was dark-skinned, broad-shouldered, and powerfully built. McCoy remembered his surprise that the likable young Klingon seemed sincerely interested in trying to help them, though he offered little hope of a favorable outcome. Colonel Worf proffered two unfamiliar-looking devices to McCoy and Kirk. Jim leaned over and shouted in McCoy's ear that they were translators. McCoy nodded and held his translator to his ear as General Chang emerged from the shadows. The stake will show that the Enterprise fired on Cronus One without provocation. The Chancellor and his advisors, having been lulled into a false sense of security with an invitation to a state dinner aboard Captain Kirk's vessel at 19.30 hours that same evening. Chang turned to Kirk with an insulting smile. Do you deny this? A muscle in Jim's jaw danced. I don't deny that we invited them to dinner. Isn't it a fact that you serve Romulan ale? The drink was served. Chang strutted back and forth in front of the prisoner's dock. And you still maintain that your ship did not fire on Cronus One? The record clearly shows there were no other ships in the sector. Kirk confirmed there were no other ships, and McCoy wanted to shout at him. Damn it, Jim, are you trying to get us the death penalty? Chang gave a faint, hateful smile. The witness is excused for the time being. Chang's next witness was one of Chancellor Gorkon's guards. The guard described what happened. Then Colonel Worf questioned the guard. Did you see the faces of those who wore the Starfleet uniforms? The guard hesitated. No, but they were human, I'm sure of that. Worf tilted his head skeptically. If you didn't see their faces, how do you know they were human? Then Chang stepped forward to take over. They fired on you? Yes, with Starfleet phasers. Thank you. That will be all. Chang turned a glittering eye on McCoy. Dr. McCoy, what is your current medical status? Oh, aside from a touch of arthritis, I'd say pretty good. Chang was not amused. He stared at the doctor until McCoy gave in. For 27 years, I have been ship surgeon, and later, Chief Medical Officer aboard the Enterprise. In three months, I'm due to retire. Dr. McCoy, was Chancellor Gorkon alive when you first examined him? Barely. I didn't, uh... I, 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 I didn't have the knowledge of Klingon anatomy I needed. Chang stepped back and gestured grandly at Kirk. I put it to you, Captain, that you were seeking revenge for the death of your son. That isn't true. Chang signaled someone at the far end of the room. I offer into the record the following excerpt from Captain Kirk's personal log. Kirk's voice filled the courtroom. I have never trusted the Klingons, and never will. 
I have never been able to forgive them for the death of my son. Are these... your words, Captain? Jim straightened to attention. Yes. Those words were spoken by me. McCoy closed his eyes and surrendered all hope. From the safety of the Enterprise Bridge, Spock watched as the judge pounded his mailed glove against stone. The crowd fell silent. In the interests of the upcoming peace talks, the sentence of death is commuted. You are to be taken to the dilithium mines of the penal asteroid archipelago of Rura Pente, there to spend the rest of your natural lives. Uhura recoiled, horrified. Scott's face went slack with shock. Rura Pente? Better to kill them now and get it over with. Spock stared mutely at the screen. He agreed with Commander Scott. A swift execution would have been more merciful. No one survived a stay of any length on Rura Pente. Death was inevitable. But Spock had no intention of allowing the inevitable to occur. He turned to Valeris. Let's see that torpedo hit again, Lieutenant. As the image of Cronus-1 reappeared on the monitor, the bridge crew watched in silence as a photon torpedo streaked across the screen. Hold. Spock studied the frozen image. If we cannot have fired that torpedo, Someone else did. Scott shook his head in confusion. Well, they didn't fire on themselves, and there were no other ships present? No. But there was an enormous neutron energy surge. Scott frowned. Mr. Spock, if another ship had been beneath us, the Klingons would have seen her. Spock turned to them. Would they, Mr. Scott? The others gazed at Spock in confusion, but Valeris understood. A bird of prey? A bird of prey cannot fire when she's cloaked. All things being equal, Mr. Scott, I would agree. However, all things are not equal. This one can. Scott's ruddy complexion paled. Then you're talking about a dreadful new engine of destruction, Mr. Spock. Spock made a calculated decision and turned to Valeris. I want this ship searched from bow to stern. Lieutenant Valeris, you are in charge. The databanks claim we fired, and if we did, the killers are here. If we did not, whoever altered the databank is here. In any event, what we are searching for is here. Chekhov's frown deepened. What are we searching for, Mr. Spock? Two pairs of gravity boots, Mr. Chekhov. Raised stinging eyes against the bitter wind. Overhead, Rura Pente's three sons floated, ghostly and pale, providing no warmth. His hands and feet ached, and the heavy leg irons didn't help. He struggled to keep his balance on the snow-covered ice and keep pace with the other prisoners. Beside him trudged five Klingon guards with vicious-looking jackal mastiffs. McCoy squinted, snow-blind, into the distance, but saw no possible destination. He clutched his ragged furs as he shivered. Jim trudged ahead of him and hadn't said a word since they'd arrived. Too damned cold even to talk. Too damned cold to survive. He almost stumbled into Jim. The head guard had signaled the prisoners to stop. The Klingon pressed an instrument on his belt. Snow slid aside to reveal a huge trap door. A Klingon, probably the commandant, emerged and surveyed the shivering group with cruel indifference. He gestured with a fur-covered arm at the barren sweep of snow. 
This is the Gulag Rur Repente. No stockade, no guard tower, no electrified frontier. Your new home is underground. Work well and you will be treated well. Work badly and you will die. The Commandant turned and descended through the trap door. The prisoners were herded after him. Below was a huge underground labyrinth with a large open yard ringed by crude huts. McCoy found it a bleak improvement. Sheltered from the bitter wind but still freezing, the leg irons were not removed, but they were allowed to wander freely in the courtyard, though after catching sight of the other inmates, McCoy wasn't sure that was a good thing. Jim, let's find some place where we can stay out of trouble. Kirk glanced at the less than friendly crowd milling around the yard and nodded, then jerked his head toward the outer wall. Maybe I shouldn't even tell you to not try and get yourself killed. That might be the easiest way to go. Kirk raised his brows at McCoy in mock surprise. We'll manage until Spock finds us. Finds our corpses, you mean? As a shadow fell across them, McCoy glanced up. The creature blocking the light was gigantic and unlike anything the doctor had ever seen. Silver scaled with horny growths extending from temple to chin, the alien loomed menacingly over Kirk and growled. Jim spread his hands in a peaceful gesture. I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage. Our universal translator was confiscated. The alien leaned closer and lifted Kirk in the air with one arm and wrapped a huge claw around his neck. <laughs> if this is your spot, we'll move on. He wants your obedience to the Brotherhood of Aliens. The speaker was humanoid, female, dark-skinned, and golden-eyed, strikingly beautiful. I... He's, he's got it. Distracted by the woman, the alien eased his grip. The woman did not quite smile as she spoke to the alien in his guttural tongue. Reluctantly, the creature lowered Kirk to the ground and wandered off. Kirk faced his savior and studied her appreciatively. Thanks. But uh, what's the Brotherhood of Aliens? Prisoners from outside the Klingon system tend to band together. I'm Martia, and you're Kirk and McCoy. How did you know? We don't get many Chancellor's assassins. We didn't kill Gorkon. Of course not. She glanced casually over one shoulder to be sure no one else was in earshot. There's a reward for your death. Someone wants you out of the way. They'll make it look like an accident. Easy enough to do here. McCoy shivered, though not from cold. Uh, what are you in for, if you don't mind my asking? She showed a flash of perfect white teeth. Smuggling. I come from Ark. Smuggling is an ancient and respected trade there. How much time's left of your sentence? Don't you know? Everyone on Rurapente is here for life. Kirk stretched out on the filthy, tattered mattress beside McCoy. He turned his head and saw that the doctor was staring wide-eyed into the darkness. Bones? Can't sleep? Three months till retirement. What a way to finish. We're not finished. We'll find a way out of here. I suppose we'll all just take a little hike to the surface. Try to flag down a passing freighter. Bones, Spock will be waiting for us. But time's the problem. You heard the judge. The peace conference is on again. Whoever killed Gorkon will sandbag the thing all over again. Unless we can find a way out of here. McCoy started 
and a muffled sound and put a finger to his lips. Nearby, a stone came loose and rolled past them. McCoy closed his eyes and pretended to sleep. Jim did the same, tensed and ready. Kirk, it's me, Martia. She crouched low beside the bunk. Listen, no one has ever escaped from Rura Penthe, but I know how to get outside the shield. That's easy. After that, Kirk, it's up to you to get us off the surface before we freeze. Can you? I can get us off the surface. She drew back her fur hood and kissed him. Then she pulled away, eyes shining. Go to sea lift in the morning for mining duty. I'll see you there. Kirk watched as she vanished into the shadows. Bones? Still think we're finished? McCoy rolled his eyes. More than ever. In a corridor on the level of the crew's quarters, Valeris stood before a light plan of the Enterprise and checked off those locations which had been thoroughly searched. Few areas remained. A shout at the corridor's far end, where others conducted a search of crew quarters, caused her to move as quickly as possible to the open cabin door in time to see a crewman remove a heavy boot from a locker. He pointed the boot toe toward the ceiling and pressed the sole against the locker's side, then withdrew his hand. The boot remained, defying gravity. Kirk stepped from the hut into the unrelenting bitter morning after a hellish night. He didn't trust Martia, and yet he and Bones were doomed if they remained inside the prisoner's compound. Beside him, Bones walked stiffly, dragging his leg irons. Kirk strained to see over the heads of the other prisoners who stood in several queues. He gestured at the open wire cage marked Sea Lift. McCoy settled into line behind Jim and waited blearily as the aged lift door screeched open. Once inside, he glanced around looking for Martia. A hideous seven-foot-tall simian with a shock of orange hair appeared to be eyeing the pair with dangerous interest. Jim, I think we've been had. The gruesome creature leaned closer. Kirk steeled himself for a fight and started at the sound of Martia's voice. No, you weren't, Doctor. Get off at the first level and join the gang going into the mine. The cage lurched to a stop and the metal door squealed open. The creature inclined its head to indicate Kirk and McCoy should follow. McCoy glanced with trepidation at the simian's huge back. What kind of a creature is this? Last night you two were spooning. Don't remind me. They shuffled behind the others into the dim mine, where they were issued a drill and a light helmet by one of the Klingon guards. They imitated the alien who claimed to be Martia. Drill the rock, pull the dilithium crystal free, set it on the nearby flatbed shuttle. Kirk and McCoy worked until hours later they were grimy and exhausted. Kirk saw the simian motioning. He turned and saw that the guards sat, eating with their backs to the prisoners. He glanced again at the creature, and his jaw dropped as the creature metamorphosed before his eyes into a young human girl who stepped easily out of her leg irons and smiled at them. Follow me. She set her drill down and walked into the depths of the mine. Kirk and McCoy glanced over their shoulders to make sure the guards weren't watching them and then followed her. The slender girl crawled nimbly into a small hole in the side of the frozen rock wall. 
Kirk got flat on his stomach, crawled in, and pulled McCoy after him. The hole opened into a new, larger tunnel, and they got back on their feet. Kirk turned toward the girl only to find that she had changed back into the simian creature. He would have felt far safer had she remained the young girl. In the distance, the guards shouted. At last, the tunnel opened into a huge abandoned entrance abutting a high ice ledge. The creature scrambled down the ledge and jumped onto a flat snowfield. Painfully, Kirk and McCoy followed. The Martia creature led them across the snowy expanse to a broad, frozen river. At the top of the riverbank, the creature paused to stare at the horizon. Kirk! McCoy! We're at the edge of the shield! Kirk followed her gaze. Beyond lay an endless ice desert. A sight that evoked not only hope, but also despair. If Spock could manage to find them in time, if they could only survive long enough on the surface, he gave McCoy a push and they staggered on. McCoy watched Rhoda Penthe's setting suns throw a cold coral light across the ice desert and knew that he was about to die. He wanted only to stop moving, to surrender to the cold. Jim, leave me. I'm finished. Spock isn't coming. Just let me die here. Jim turned to display a green stain on the back of his ragged coat. It's the Viridium patch. Spock slapped on my back right before we went aboard Gorkin's ship. Well, that cunning little Vulcan. An emergency supply of Viridium patches were kept on the bridge when haste prohibited stopping by sick bay for subcutaneous transponders. The patches were messier, but had far greater range. Bones? Once we're beyond the shield, they should be able to pick it up two sectors away. In front of them, the ape-like creature with Martia's voice pointed to an icy ridge. We're almost there. Once we're outside, we'll make camp. The trickle of hope pushed McCoy past fatigue, past all pain. Having completed his evening meditation, Spock reclined on his berth as he awaited word from the bridge. Once that word came, there would be little time to effect a rescue. If the rumors Spock had heard were true, the climate on Rua Repente's unshielded surface was lethally cold. If that word never came, Captain Kirk and Dr. McCoy were already dead. In either event, the conspirators would do whatever necessary to sabotage the peace conference. Chancellor Azetbur's life, as well as the lives of all those attending the conference, was in grave danger. Were there those within Starfleet, indeed aboard the Enterprise, loyal to the Klingon warrior class? A strange conviction seized him. Intuition, Jim Kirk would have called it that he knew the solution to the mystery, yet was refusing to see the evidence that lay before his eyes. The intercom whistled. Before Spock could sit up and touch the controls to respond, Uhura's excited voice filtered through on override. Mr. Spock, I've got them. They're outside the shield. By the time the Martia creature, Kirk and McCoy, reached the ridge, dusk had given way to blackness, littered with stars. The temperature dipped, but the doctor was heartened. Tracing the Viridium patch, Spock would be able to find them in time. The creature produced a flare from its coat and broke it in half. The flare blazed brightly for an instant, 
then formed a small fire. McCoy held his hands to the flames and glanced at the creature. Would you mind explaining that little trick you do? I'm a cameloid. I've heard of cameloids. Shapeshifters. I thought you were mythical. The creature graced him with a snaggletoothed smile. Give a girl a chance, Captain. As they watched, it began to metamorphose into the smaller, finer features of the beautiful Martia. She directed her now enticing smile at Kirk. We're outside the shield. Now it's your turn. If you say so. Kirk rose, stretched, then stepped forward and with a lightning swift motion that startled McCoy, slugged the woman full force on the jaw. Martia fell back and glanced up at them with a wounded expression. You didn't need our help getting anywhere. What are you getting in return? That fire is to let them know we are here. As Kirk spoke, Martia began to metamorphose back into the brute. I'm getting a full pardon. An accident would have looked suspicious. But killed while attempting escape. Now that's convincing. Kirk and the creature lunged at each other. Kirk held on, but lost his grip as Martia's shaggy form transformed into little more than a pair of wide, sharp fanged jaws. The creature became a mass of slime-coated black tentacles that threatened to strangle the life out of Kirk. Jim finally grasped the creature, but it became a miniature female that slipped easily from his hands and scrambled past McCoy. The doctor leapt with all his energy and managed to catch hold of a tiny ankle. Even as he fell, rolling in the snow, he felt the ankle in his grip swell in size. He looked up to see an exact replica of Jim Kirk that struck him full across the face. The doctor fell back in the snow and watched as the real Jim faced his double. They sprang at each other and McCoy closed his eyes and fought dizziness until he slipped gratefully into darkness. Alone and exhausted, Scott sat in the officer's mess and allowed himself a second cup of coffee. He glanced at his data pad to check off the areas of the ship that had been searched. The odds of finding the missing uniforms were getting worse. He ran a finger under his collar and realized he was uncomfortably warm. Instinctively, he reached a hand for the nearby circulation vent to cool himself. No air. The vent was blocked. He quickly removed the cover and peered inside. Something, wadded fabric, had been stuffed inside the vent, completely cutting off the airflow. Ah, the uniforms. He pulled them out and hurried to find Spock. Out of the corner of his eye, Kirk saw McCoy weakly raise his head as he came to. He and Martia, now his double, circled each other, arms locked in a restraining embrace. She seemed reluctant to change, as if the efforts of doing so earlier had drained her. She pulled and forced Kirk off his feet, sending him spinning into the snow. The moist heat on the back of his scalp made him turn and stare, eyeball to eyeball, into the dripping jaws of a sharp, fanged, Klingon Mastiff. He glanced over at Martia, still in her Kirk disguise. The Commandant raised his weapon and narrowed his eyes at them. Kirk, aware of the confusion, pointed at Martia. Not me, idiot! Him! The Commandant fired at Martia. She screamed and transformed into the monstrous brute. Then she fell to the snow and died. He turned to favor Kirk and McCoy with an ironic grin. No witnesses. As Kirk had suspected, 
The Klingons never meant to keep their bargain with Martia. The guard lifted his weapon and aimed it at Kirk and McCoy. Jim nodded. So, that's it. Killed while trying to escape, huh? That's what he wanted. Who? Who wants us killed? The Klingon's grin became a sly half-moon smile. I have heard you humans once had a custom of granting the condemned one a wish before execution. I will grant you this courtesy before death. His name... The Klingon's words were drowned out by the growing hum of a transporter. Kirk felt the brief spell of dizziness that accompanied dematerialization. The scene faded as the guards raised their weapons to fire. And he was in the Enterprise transporter room. Damn it all to hell. If you'd only waited two more seconds. He was just about to explain the whole damn thing. Chekhov was smiling. Captain, you want to go back? McCoy half shouted in the captain's ear. What the hell's the matter with you, Jim? We were just rescued. Kirk turned to Spock. We have to find out where they are holding the peace conference. That will be the next target. Agreed, Captain. But how? Spock, come on. Kirk led Spock and the others down the corridor to the bridge turbo lift. The warmth and sense of urgency about the peace conference had revived Kirk's energy. Captain, the Klingons have a new weapon. A bird of prey that can fire while cloaked. She torpedoed Gorkon's ship, and I have reason to believe that Gorkon's murderers are aboard this vessel. Kirk searched Spock's expression carefully, but could find no sign that the Vulcan had come to the same conclusion as he had concerning the guilty party. Scott ran towards them, clutching wadded uniforms in his hands. Captain, Mr. Spock, I've found the missing uniforms with Klingon blood on them. They belong to... As they rounded the corner... Before them lay two crewmen sprawled on the floor. McCoy knelt to examine them and glanced up at Kirk and shook his head. Aghast, Scott stared down at them. Hey, the uniforms belong to these men, Burke and Samno. First rule of assassination, Scotty. Always kill the assassins. Kirk met Spock's gaze, sure that the Vulcan did not know. Spock, can I talk to you in private? Spock tilted his head curiously and followed Kirk down the corridor. Reluctantly, gently, Jim drew a breath and explained who Burke and Samno's killer was. Valeris had been on the last leg of the search when the voice came over the public intercom. Attention. Yeoman Burke and Samno have been shot and wish to make statements. Court recorder to sickbay on the double. Valeris decided carefully what to do. She would abandon her search and go immediately to sickbay. In sickbay, Spock lay on the pallet, surrounded by darkness and the soft sounds of breathing. The door to sick base slid open. A silhouette traversed the darkness, approached the bed where Spock lay quietly until the overhead flashed on, revealing the killer and intended victim to each other. Spock sat up and gazed without surprise into Valera's face. You have to kill, if you are logical. I don't want to. Spock looked pointedly at her phaser. I believe you, but... What you want is irrelevant. On a nearby pallet, Kirk sat up, and McCoy emerged from the shadows. Valeris, the operation is over. Slowly, she lowered the phaser to her side and bowed her head. As the security escort led her to the bridge, Valeris experienced a sense of failure because she had not accomplished her mission. She felt no shame for what she had done. She had arrived at her decisions most logically. 
One could reasonably expect Klingons to behave in a consistently violent fashion. Given that, it is illogical to attempt to negotiate peace. And logic insisted that the Federation could best win a war now, while the Klingons were most vulnerable. She regretted Burke and Samno's deaths, but they scarcely outweighed the uncounted millions who had perished at Klingon hands since the Federation first encountered them. Yet, as they arrived on the Enterprise Bridge and Spock took his place beside his captain and Dr. McCoy, she imagined she saw a brief flicker of pain in Spock's dark eyes. The captain's expression hardened. Let's waste no time, Lieutenant. Name your co-conspirators and give us the location of the peace conference. Commander Uhura, make a record of everything said. For Spock's sake, Valeris controlled her anger. You can't prove anything. She turned to Spock. I tried to tell you. The Knight Enterprise left space dock. You would not listen. You speak of logic. Yet, you would have the last of us bow before our killers, before we take action to protect ourselves. You contend that you are Vulcan, that you seek peace at any cost. Yet you serve in Starfleet, on a ship capable of massive destruction. And now you would seek peace with the Klingons. Would trust them. How trustworthy can they be? They conspired with us to assassinate their own chancellor. Kirk advanced threateningly. Us? Who is us? Names, Lieutenant. Kirk turned to his first officer and Spock nodded. He stepped toward Valeris, hand extended to touch her face. His cool fingers brushed her cheek. She tensed, anticipating the agony of mental intrusion that would follow. It did not. The mind touch, gentle as a caress, merely asked permission and lingered. Hesitantly, she opened her mind to Spock. She felt herself drift as if in a waking dream. Spock spoke in a low, hypnotic voice. Admiral Cartwright, General Chang, the Romulan Ambassador Nunclos. This is incredible. Is she telling us Klingons and Federation members are conspiring together? Spock, where is the conference? Spock withdrew his hand. She does not know. Commander Uhura, raise the Excelsior. She ought to have the coordinates. The commander's an old friend of ours. When Sulu appeared on the main viewer, he seemed startled by Kirk's grizzled visage. You understand, Captain Sulu, that by even talking to us, you're violating regulations. Sulu leaned forward, squinting. I'm sorry, Captain. Your message is uh, breaking up. Bless you, Sulu. Where's the peace conference? They're going to attempt another assassination. Sulu did not hesitate. The conference is at Kittimer, in Klingon space near the Romulan border. I'm sending the exact coordinates on a coded frequency. I'm afraid we'll need more than that. There's a bird of prey on the lookout for us, and she can fire while cloaked. I'm getting underway now, but the conference starts today and my chances of reaching it are slim. Thank you, Captain Sulu. Don't mention it, Captain Kirk. We're on our way. In the huge domed council chamber on Kittimer, Azabur sat in the place of honor beside Federation President Ragoratri. She watched as the red-sashed Klingon delegation, led by Ambassador Kamarag, entered and took their places. After learning of Kirk's escape and the disappearance of the Enterprise, Brigadier Curla had arranged additional security. If he proved untrustworthy, Azadur had no chance of surviving. She did not fear death, but she feared deeply what would happen to her people should she be killed and the peace conference fail. 
Admiral Cartwright took his seat along with the other Federation dignitaries and feigned a polite interest as he peered out at the crowd. Concealing his agitation was not easy. He had lost contact with Lieutenant Valeris aboard the Enterprise, and now Cartwright could only anticipate the worst, that Kirk and company had somehow managed to piece together the puzzle and were on their way to Kittimer. Cartwright started slightly as he glimpsed the face he sought a dark-skinned, heavy-browed Klingon who had managed to get a small, unobtrusive-looking valise past security. The room thundered with applause as Chancellor Azadbur rose and approached the podium. The Klingon surreptitiously scanned the crowd and finally stared in the Admiral's direction. Their gazes locked, and Cartwright gave a slow nod. The Enterprise slowed to impulse as she neared Kittimer. On the main visual, the empty starfield revealed nothing of the danger awaiting them. Kirk rose and went over to the science station, where Spock was bent over his scanners. Kirk peered over the Vulcan's shoulder. She's here, somewhere. Chekhov turned from the helm. But if she's cloaked, then all we've got is a neutron radiation surge. And by the time we're close enough to record it, we're ashes. Spock straightened, a thoughtful expression on his face. Captain, our job is to get to the conference. The cloaked ship's job will be to stop us. You mean, make ourselves a target? Kirk hesitated only for a split second before finding his voice. Shields, battle stations. Mr. Chekhov, take us forward. Uhura? Nothing, Captain. If they're here, they've engaged the cloaking device. Kirk pitched forward as the ship heaved. The view screen flashed with blinding light from the explosion. Chekhov pulled himself back to his station. Captain, shall we attempt to return fire? At what, Mr. Chekhov? The force of the next hit threw Kirk from his con against McCoy. He could do nothing, but he had to find a way to buy some time to give the Excelsior a chance to show. Scotty, reverse engines. All astern, one half impulse power. Back off. Kirk narrowed his eyes at the main visual and what appeared to be empty space, straining with fading hope to see the sleek, familiar outline of the Excelsior. Suddenly, Chang's harsh voice reverberated over the intercom. <laughs> I say you, Kirk. To be honest... Warrior to warrior, don't you prefer it this way? No peace in our time. <laughs> Once more unto the breach, dear friends. <laughs> Kirk hit the intercom control. Our time is over, Chang. History won't stand still for the likes of either of us. A brilliant flare appeared on the view screen and rocketed toward the Enterprise. Scott's voice filtered through the intercom grid. You cannot take much more of this, Captain. Bent over his viewer, Spock narrowed his eyes in thought. Captain, sensors reveal faint traces of plasma. Under impulse power, the Klingon vessel expends fuel like any other ship. But accurate targeting of the source may prove difficult. Spock, the portable equipment in the science lab for atmospheric analysis. McCoy's eyes widened, and he started for the lift. That's it, then. Scotty's tied up in engineering, so I'm going to perform surgery on a torpedo. Spock followed McCoy. You may need assistance, Doctor. As they entered the lift, the ship shuddered, struck again. Kirk stared at the view screen with renewed hope. If the Enterprise could only withstand the pounding, there was a chance. McCoy and Spock had been working for some time in the torpedo bay. While on the bridge, Kirk listened grimly to Scotty's report. Captain, she's packing quite a wallop. Shields weakening. Uhura interrupted. Captain Kirk, message from Captain Sulu. The cavalry's here. As the Excelsior loomed on the bridge viewscreen, Chang's voice filtered through the intercom once more. 
So, the game's afoot. On the visual, a torpedo streaked toward the Excelsior and exploded harmlessly against her shield. Kirk said a silent prayer of thanks to Sulu. Hold us steady, Mr. Scott. Ready to fire. Bones, where's my torpedo? In the torpedo bay, Spock reassured Dr. McCoy. Calm yourself, Doctor. The operation is almost complete. Within seconds, McCoy had drilled an adequate opening in the torpedo's nose. Spock lifted the sensor and allowed the doctor to guide it into the opening. McCoy tightened the sensor into place with a final twist. Jim, she's ready. Lock and load. He and Spock leapt out of the way as the torpedo started forward down the lift. Betty, we're retiring, Spock, just as I was starting to understand you. The impact of the next explosion hurled them both to the deck. On the bridge, Jim Kirk was flung from his chair. Chekhov was already back at his station. Shields have buckled, sir. Kirk didn't waste a second. Fire. Aboard the Dacron, Chang smiled at the feeble attempts of the Enterprise to fire blindly. He saw no reason to waste the power necessary to raise the Dacron's shields. The torpedo began circling then steadied itself and headed in the Dacron's direction. Chang looked at his helmsman. Move out of the way, impulse power. The Dacron neatly sidestepped the oncoming warhead. The torpedo circled once more, then turned and pursued the ship. Chang stared in disbelief. By the time he opened his mouth to issue the commands to raise shields, it was too late. The Dacron reeled from a crippling blow. Chang saw the Enterprise and Excelsior move into position. He saw no point railing at fate, and there was no dishonor in being bested by the likes of Kirk. He closed his eye and smiled as the two ships opened fire. Around him, the bridge dissolved into screams and fiery fragments. Admiral Cartwright's Klingon found his way easily up a back lift to a deserted balcony overlooking the speaker's dais. He opened his valise and began assembling the weapon designed especially for this event. The phaser was quite lethal. Below him, the audience applauded as it burst speech. The assassin raised his weapon, held her in his sights, and smiled. At that moment, Jim Kirk materialized into the throng and broke into a dead run toward the central dais. He pushed through the crowd, burst past the guards, and knocked Azadbur off her feet as the searing heat of the phaser blast passed millimeters above his back. Kirk looked up at the sound of Admiral Cartwright's outraged voice. Arrest those men! The crowd thinned to reveal Spock, stepping forward to confront Cartwright. Arrest yourself, Admiral. Azatbur was back on her feet and flanked by guards. What is the meaning of this? Kirk held out his hands in a gesture of peace. It's about the future, Madam Chancellor. Some people think the future means the end of history. But we haven't run out of history just yet. For an instant, as it were, his expression was dark, unreadable, and then brightened with a slow, dawning radiance. Kirk, you restored my father's faith. You restored my son's... He was not sure who reached out first, Klingon or human. It did not matter. He and Azatbur embraced each other in shared grief and joy. <laughs>